I think many people know that Jeff and I went to competing photo art schools. The school that Jeff went to is known more for its technical prowess, and the school that I went to was known maybe by some more for its artistic prowess. But while we've been taping things here at uh, Photo PXL, I started to realize that <clears throat> Jeff needed a little refresher on some basic color science. And the, uh, and the art major here is gonna do the instruction. He thinks, go ahead, Dano. Tell me what I don't know. What many people are unaware of is that color is actually three-dimensional, and it's best described in three dimensions along hue, saturation, and lightness. Now, a lot of people have heard these terms. They know hue. That's the color. Saturation is the intensity of the hue. But this concept of lightness, which is a strange term, is the degree of white or black mixed with a hue. But how does that compare to luminosity or luminance of these other things or brightness? And then for the color scientists out there, they'll know that anytime the word or the, the suffix ness is in the word, that's perceptual and not necessarily measurable in a standard way, which introduces all the wonderful things about art and a lot of science. The whole thing about color is you have to perceive the color and see the color. And you're talking about this technical stuff, which is fine. Let's go ahead and, and look at the three attributes of color, hue, saturation, and lightness, not luminosity, which you've noted in Photoshop that is technically incorrect. It's not luminosity. HSL is lightness. So go ahead. And for the pure scientists out there, we can only sense color. We can't really see color. But yep. that's a whole other discussion. Perceive. Ooh. Many people are familiar with what's known as a chromaticity diagram. Those who did not get the quite technical expertise they know might call it the horseshoe. Mm -hmm. uh, it was developed in 1931. These dates are important. We'll talk about it a little bit why. And it's on an XY scale, meaning it's two-dimensional. Uh, it was adopted from very basic experiments uh, back in 1931 when they didn't have the tools and the understanding of human color Actually, vision. I, I believe it was the Swiss Army, but it was a whole bunch of Swiss Army guys in 1931 being tested to see how much they could see color. And uh, the operative word was not a bunch, but a very limited number. So yeah. a very small sample size of men, and men do have a propensity for having some not entirely red-green color blindness. Yeah, and, and that was one of the problems because women can see better color than men. So for those that are using this chromaticity diagram today to talk about color gamut, you're basing it on a very limited number of Swiss Army men from 1931. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the thing about it is that it's perceptually non-uniform. You have this huge green area and this much smaller red area, but the actual nanometer scale there doesn't change. So. Do we really see that way? Again, this is not a criticism of that. That's the best they could do um, a long time ago. But it's not how humans see color. And also, because it's two-dimensional, it can only measure gamut area, and it cannot measure gamut volume. Yeah. So in 1976, again, these dates, you'll know, see why we use these things. The uh, color scientists came together in an organization called the CIE, which Jeff, uh, uh, I can't pronounce it. In French, it means... Commission Internationale de Eclairage. CIE. You're going to see this CIE. thing. You'll see a CIE. Oh, it's a CIE color. I see all these kind of things. So that's why it's abbreviated. Uh, scientists came together, again, 1976, to deal with this non-perceptual chromaticity diagram to find a way and develop a system where humans actually see color. And they developed what's called LAB. Technically, L star, A star, B star. Yes. Lab. Uh, some people call it lab, some people call it C-lab, some people call it lab color. Uh, a little uh, tidbit, wherever you see a st an asterisk star, that means it's the latest standard. That's why in that XY diagram before, you don't see the stars. So look for the stars, and also 1976 is when they did that. It is three-dimensional, and it works on how we see color on hue, saturation, and lightness. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, so Dano, this, this computer thing, showing all this stuff, that's all fine and good. But I wanted to have kind of a, a real life three-dimensional method of showing gamut volume. So give it to me. <laughs> this is one of Kevin's toys. So if we think of 
total volume of color, color gamut, sRGB is kind of like this, okay? So, you know, you've got red, green, blue, and um, you've got the axis for lightness. So one of the things that uh, people wonder about is, you know, the size of the gamut um, is important in terms of being able to manage and control and print color, right? Because you're going from camera to printer. So this is sRGB. Adobe RGB is bigger, okay? Not hugely bigger, as we'll see in Dano's very expert demonstration. <laughs> but then, you know, here's uh, sRGB, here's Adobe RGB, and then here's Profoto <laughs> RGB. It is really super big, okay? And one might wonder, well, why would you want to have a really large gamut working space like in Photoshop? Uh, well, because Profoto RGB is the only color space that can contain all of the colors that the camera can capture and all of the colors that the printer can capture. So let's use a, a little bit more sophisticated software from the art school graduate uh, than, uh, although this is kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're in a program uh, called ColorThink, and uh, this shows the LAB color space. This is pretty geeky. It's Go ahead, show me what you think. Uh, pay attention. Okay. Okay. So, as I move this around, you can see that it is perceptually uniform in a grid, and this is the lightness scale. Again, it's not luminous or luminosity. White is 100 at the top, black is zero at the bottom. And on these AB axes, the further out you go after you plot a hue, which is a, a mix of lightness and the color, now the further out you go on these axes, the more saturation there will be. Now, a lot of people don't realize, they think of skin tone, uh, Caucasian skin tone is relatively pastel. It's actually quite colorful a lot of saturation. It's just higher on the lightness scale. Unless you get a tan. <laughs> <laughs> now, the beauty about working in three dimensions is we can see things, and then I can make you very sleepy by moving this around. But let's first look at the sRGB color gamut three-dimensionally. This is sRGB. It would be a four to five hour discussion about why it's this unusual shape. Uh, and there'd be a lot of uh, interesting discussion with color scientists that both of us know. But for now, just accept that this is sRGB and it's based on uh, better color science and understanding how humans see color in three dimensions. And we can, what's important is we can look at it in all different directions versus that old chromaticity diagram, which can be very misleading. Or, or you could do my favorite thing is let it spin, spin it. Well, we're going to make people feel very ill if we okay, let this stop. down this too far. Stop. Okay, there we go. So we've talked a lot about uh, why uh, many photographers use Adobe RGB, or they're told use Adobe RGB. And it's called Adobe RGB 1998, as I mentioned earlier, these dates. And why is that? Because it came to the market in 1998. <laughs> well, there's a backstory to that. It's actually based upon a, a, a typo. Mark mm -hmm. Hamburg was trying to come up with a color space um, for Photoshop 5, 5.0, not CS5. Uh, and uh, he copied down some chromaticity uh, data from a SEMTI, which is SEMT, uh, the Society for Motion Picture um, uh, SEMTI Engineers, Technical Engineers, whatever. Uh, but what ended up happening- We, we call it SEMTI. SEMTI, 240M. And, uh, but there was a typo that was later corrected and then what ended up happening is that uh, they had to, Adobe couldn't, they had to change the name from 7240M to Adobe RGB 1998. Mm -hmm. And I've heard a slightly different version. It doesn't matter, it happened in 1998 and uh, many people, many photographers are using it because it's a wider color space. Well, what does that mean? Let me turn it on and I'm gonna adjust the opacity. So this is Adobe RGB 1998, mm -hmm. let's just call it Adobe RGB. We can move around. And then if I reduce the opacity, we can see the sRGB underneath it. Mm -hmm. And you can see how much wider, and this is what these terms mean. This is a wider color gamut. Gamut is a range of colors. 
in three dimension, we can measure the volume with that old chromaticity diagram. We can only measure the area that doesn't tell us anything. And color volume is important. Color volume is important in profile making and understanding the amount of color that you can make or the amount of color you have available to you. So this is Adobe RGB 1998 and below that is sRGB 1998. But actually for many years, I don't have the exact number, but at the time of this taping, well over 10 years, uh, Epson uh, professional printers, depending on the paper you're using, can print wider than Adobe RGB. Mm -hmm. So essentially you're then clipping colors if you use Adobe RGB 1998. So let's take a look at Pro Photo RGB and boom. You see, this is a much bigger, wider color gamut. To be uh, honest, there are some imaginary colors. There are colors in Pro Photo RGB that don't actually exist in, in uh, human vision or color. Much like uh, whatever this is called, uh, it can be mathematically described, but we can't visually see them. Yep. Uh, but the benefit of Pro Photo RGB and let me uh, reduce the opacity so you can see everything underneath it. There is Adobe RGB, mm -hmm. and here's Pro Photo RGB, is that essentially, for the most part, all colors can be captured in Pro Photo RGB. So when you're opening it in Photoshop, when you're working in Pro Photo RGB, you're not clipping any colors. Correct. You have to make a decision later but because some colors are impossible to print or don't even exist, and that's what rendering intent is about. But you want to make that decision at the end of the process. You don't want to clip those colors before you get started. There's a thing, and I'll, I'll mention this is a little geek, geeky, uh, but the Nyquist theorem, which is basically you need to edit in a data space that is larger than the final output requirement. It's used for audio. So, uh, you know, the bigger the working space, you know, basically, you don't lose any color in the process of doing the editing. Did you learn that at that school you went to? No, uh, I was talking to one of the color geeks. Oh, okay, great. Uh, Nyquist theorem. I, I thought that's what you take when you have a sore throat or a stuffy nose. Yeah, that's Nyquist. Ah, okay. So this this whole thing about three-dimensionality is kind of interesting, but it's it's a little esoteric. So what I'd like to do is actually show a couple of images and how they actually look three-dimensionally. So uh, These are Dano images? They're Dano images. Well, this one, yes, there's a couple of Dano images. Okay. Uh, so this is an image that I shot. Uh, many people are familiar with this place called Old Car City. It's about two hours north of Atlanta. I was at some trade show in Atlanta and headed up to uh, this very small town. But it's an amazing place. But if you look at this image, you know, it, there's not a lot of saturation in there. Uh, but it's kind of monochromatic. Yeah, you know, so let's see how that plots. So the little points are specific areas that the color is mapped to the graph. Right. The color in the image is mapped to the graph. So zero to 100, uh, the highlights in this part of the hood ornament are right here. The, this kind of green patina, which has a little bit more color and, and saturating, it's moving out on the axis here. And let's take a look at it here and you know, move around. But you can see that it's a relatively narrow gamut image. And you know what? It's like, well, I've, I've been using sRGB successfully for years and everything is great and it looks great. Well, let's put the sRGB color gamut on there. And sure enough, that type of image easily fits within sRGB. No problem at no. all. No. And uh, so we're not here to denigrate sRGB. Well, I'm not. Well, there's a reason that it's called sRGB. <laughs> Some think it's simple RGB or stupid RGB or shitty RGB. But th the reason you don't want to open a raw file in sRGB, unless that's all you're shooting. If all you're shooting and all you're working with are pure pastel colors, I mean, there's an argument that could be made. Well, okay. But let's say and I'm going to pull up a very saturated image that seems to be my uh, <coughs> my uh, hallmark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is the <laughs> uh, the uh, Chicken Men. It was from the Urban Iditarod in Portland, Oregon, where the day the Iditarod in Alaska in Portland, they mush bar to bar in various uh, outfits. 
in shopping Chicken carts. Nuts. Yeah, you know, it was my kind of thing. You know, I kind of like it. Anyway, it kind of is a very saturated image. Uh, so let's take a look at how that image plots. And whoa, look at that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so some real excursions <laughs> in the red and the um, uh, orange, uh, yellow. Yeah. And also, it seems the nice thing about three dimensions, we can look around. There's quite a lot of blues if you move yep. around in that sky image. Just a reminder, let me pull that up there. Mm -hmm. You can see, all, so what that's plotting are these yellows and reds and also those blues. So, okay, let's see what happens with sRGB. So what this shows is this term that's been used a lot, but it kind of visually demonstrates these colors in my image, in my file, are now out of gamut to sRGB. And what happens if you use sRGB as a working space, that color is clipped, it's gone. The purpose of maintaining the total gamut of the original capture is to keep it until you actually decide how you're gonna output it. But what about Adobe RGB? Isn't that the gold standard for well, photography? Well, let's take a look. Still. Mm -hmm. Look at these colors that are out. So that's the reason that the recommendation is to always open in ProPhoto RGB because it's there. You can deal with out of gamma colors later, but don't clip them in the early stages because now virtually, not all these colors, and certainly there's colors in ProPhoto RGB, I think especially in the extreme edges and these blues that no, I mean, they don't almost don't exist. Yeah. But you can clearly see in this very saturated image that all those yellows and oranges that were out of gamut for Adobe RGB are now within, you're holding on to that information. And those of you that use uh, Camera Raw in Photoshop or Lightroom, the internal working space of Camera Raw and Lightroom is the ProPhoto RGB chromaticities, but a linear gamma. So when you bring it into Photoshop, uh, all you're doing is doing a gamma compression uh, to work on it in Photoshop. Right. Uh, so let's take a, a less crazy saturated image. And this is an image by a nature photographer, it was terrific, named Elizabeth Carmel. And this is how this image plots three-dimensionally. But look at all those yellows that are still out there. Mm -hmm. Remember, it's like, well, those are more pastel. Pastel is a, a you want to think in terms of L star. And you can have something very colorful, but it might be higher in lightness. And if you open in Pro Photo RGB, no problem. We can easily get all that. But no, uh, no printer from any manufacturer, no ink, no paper can print Pro Photo RGB. The cotton fiber papers, they're gonna, they're gonna hold a narrower gamut for a whole variety of reasons, and it's just physics. So let's take a look at Elizabeth's image and a profile for Legacy Barita 2 paper. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a pretty big gamut. So that's the paper, but if you look over here, and, and it's important to look, look around, you're gonna see that, oh, you know what? There are colors that are still out of gamut. Yeah. This is what the rendering intent is for. You wanna tell the printer for these out of gamut colors to either remap them to the edge of the gamut, mm -hmm. well, or to remap it in some way within the gamut itself. When you're clipping a color, it doesn't like disappear. It's not like, oh, I've just got holes in my print from where the color was. It tends to desaturate it make it darker because it's moving it in outside of that gamut. But this is where you have to make the decision about using relative color metric or perceptual to tell what's going on there. And the best way to do it from my standpoint, because I'm hung out with too many color scientists who have tried to explain what's going on here, is calibrate your monitor and then look at the two and decide which one looks better and your decision is made. One of the things in terms of the whole color management you have the camera that can capture a wide gamut of color. And then you have your working space, um, ProPhoto RGB, which is a big gamut of color. And then you've got the printer gamut of color on the printer profile. The other question is, how do you actually see the images on your display? And, you know, uh, we're working on a laptop, which I would never use for final color, although some people do. Mm -hmm. Uh, with difficulty. But what I do is I use a 
a large gamut display. I happen to use an NEC display, but there are other large gamut displays. And I've got my profile for my NEC. So there is the profile for the display. And then compare that to Adobe RGB. And it's essentially the same. So what you're seeing on the display is, is a large gamut of color and compare that to uh, sRGB. So there's sRGB and then there's the wide gamut display, uh, which is 98% of uh, Adobe RGB. Mm -hmm. So if you're making color critical decisions, particularly soft proofing before printing, you wanna be using a calibrated wide gamut display, which is the best option. And that's really, uh, I soft proof pretty much everything that I print. And the nice thing is when the image comes out of the printer, it looks the way I'm expecting it to look. No surprises. And then the other thing about soft proofing, and, and Dano won't like this, it saves on ink and paper because I don't have to make as many test proofs. We want people making lots of prints successfully, not, yeah. not lots of prints with uh, only a few that look right. And that is the whole benefit uh, and use of soft proofing, either in Photoshop or Lightroom or in the Epson uh, print layout. I did go to art school. I like the, the moving stuff and the pretty pictures. Seems do the trick.